In the next few videos, we're going to go over chemical thermodynamics. This video is going to start by going over enthalpy as well as how to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction using the heat of formation. Now, first thing we should discuss is what is chemical thermodynamics? Chemical thermodynamics is the study of the heat, work, and energy involved with chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are processes where chemical bonds are broken and formed. It's important to note that chemical reactions are involved with chemical thermodynamics. And that's because in other videos, we're going to discuss physical thermodynamics where we're looking at the transfer of energy in processes where chemical reactions do not occur. So that means chemical bonds are not broken or formed. All right, so enthalpy. Enthalpy has a fairly complicated definition. It is defined as the sum of the internal energy and product of the pressure and volume of a system. Fortunately for the MCAT, you don't have to worry too much about that definition, and that's because the MCAT mostly tests enthalpy change. Enthalpy change is the amount of heat released or absorbed in a process, which in the case of chemical thermodynamics is the amount of heat released or absorbed in a chemical reaction. Now, one important thing to know about enthalpy is that enthalpy is a state function. As a state function, it means that the value of the enthalpy is independent of path. So what that means is, your starting reactants will have some amount of enthalpy. Your products will have some amount of enthalpy. The amount of enthalpy that the reactants and products have does not depend on the path that is taken to get from the reactants to the products. This will have implications later when we're talking about how to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction. All right. So next, since enthalpy change is looking at the amount of heat released or absorbed in a reaction, that means the enthalpy change can take on both positive and negative values. Positive values of enthalpy change means that heat is absorbed. And when heat is absorbed, we say that we're dealing with what is called an endothermic process. And similarly, if the enthalpy change is negative, then we say that heat is released. And if heat is released, then we are working with an exothermic process. So that's important to keep in mind, just what delta H being negative and what delta H being positive means. Now again, since we're looking at chemical reactions, we're looking at breaking and forming chemical bonds. And it's important for you to know what is the energy change involved with forming chemical bonds as well as breaking chemical bonds. And specifically, breaking chemical bonds requires energy. And if breaking chemical bonds requires energy, that means breaking bonds is an endothermic process. And conversely, forming chemical bonds releases energy. Meaning that the formation of chemical bonds is an exothermic process. Now, we want to be a little careful here because a lot of you probably recall in biology and in your reading, learning about how ATP hydrolysis is an exothermic process. And they're always talking about breaking a high energy phosphate bond. But that's actually a bit misleading because it makes it sound like breaking bonds can release energy. But that's not the case. I can assure you that breaking bonds always requires energy and forming bonds always releases energy. So how can we resolve the issue with ATP hydrolysis? Well, if you take a look at this diagram, you can see that in ATP hydrolysis, we're using a molecule of water to break a bond in ATP, specifically to break off one of the phosphate groups. And you can note that there are bonds being broken and there are bonds being formed in the process. And in particular, when you look at the bond being broken, which is the bond connecting one of the phosphates to the other two phosphates, 
you should know that's actually a very weak bond. You have three negatively charged phosphates by each other. Since they all have the same charge, they repel each other. So since that bond in the phosphate is very weak, very little energy is required to break that bond. And the bonds that are formed in the products in ADP and the free phosphate, those bonds formed are much stronger, which means that not much energy is required to break the bond and a lot of energy is released in the bonds formed in the products. So the net process of ATP hydrolysis is exothermic. So I hope that clears up the issue with ATB hydrolysis. It's not that breaking bonds releases energy. Breaking bonds absolutely requires energy, but the net process, the net energy of breaking bonds and forming bonds in ATP hydrolysis is an exothermic reaction. Okay, so now that we have that down, I wanna talk more about calculating the enthalpy change of a reaction. This is sometimes also called the heat of reaction. And if we're looking at the heat of reaction under standard conditions, then we're looking at the standard heats of reaction, which is denoted by delta H naught reaction. The naught symbol means that we're looking at standard conditions. Standard conditions refers to conditions where we're at 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin, one atmosphere of pressure and one molar concentrations. It's important to note, of course, that this is not STP, right? Standard temperature and pressure is different from standard conditions. At STP, we're at zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere pressure. So these two are different. Now, for the MCAT, they're going to expect you to be able to calculate the heat of reaction. And there are several different ways you're expected to do that using the heats of formation, bond dissociation energies, or Hess's law. In this video, we're going to talk about heats of formation, and in later videos, we'll cover the two other methods. So to start, heat of formation. The heat of formation is defined as the enthalpy change of forming one mole of a compound from its constituent elements in their standard states. So what we mean by standard states is really looking at the most stable form of the compound. So the most stable form of the compound under standard conditions. That's what we're talking about with standard state. So a few things to know. Well, if you have elements in their standard state, which is just how the compounds naturally occur, then it's important to note that the heat of formation of any elements in their standard state is simply zero. All right, if that's just how the compounds naturally occur in the standard state, then you don't need any energy to form those compounds. And generally, for most elements on the periodic table, that just means if you have individual carbon atoms or individual aluminum atoms, those will have a free a heat of formation of zero. Now, another important thing to know is that some elements in their standard state do not exist as monatomic atoms, like carbon. They actually exist as diatomic molecules. And these diatomic molecules are actually good to keep in mind for the MCAT, and there are seven of them. Hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine, oxygen, iodine, chlorine, and bromine. So these seven elements occur as diatomic molecules in their standard state, which means these seven molecules all have a heat of formation of zero. And one helpful way to memorize these seven diatomic elements is using the mnemonic, have no fear of ice cold beer. So that's a handy way for you to memorize what the seven diatomic elements are in the standard state. Okay, so how can we use the heat of formation to be able to calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction? Well, there's an equation that we can use where the enthalpy change of a reaction under standard conditions is equal to the sum of the number of moles times the heat of formation of all the products 
minus the sum of the number of moles of reactants times their heats of formation. So this is an equation you're going to want to keep in mind. Again, you're just adding up the heats of formation of all the products, and then you're subtracting the heats of formation of all the reactants. And as one demonstration of this equation, we have an example over here where we're asking, what is the enthalpy change of the following reaction? And the reaction is two molecules of hydrogen plus one molecule of oxygen gives us two molecules of water. Now, you should know on the MCAT, you're not expected to have any heats of formation memorized for the exam, with the exception of compounds in their standard state and, uh, and elements in their standard state. You should know that they all have a heat of formation of zero. But for all other compounds, you don't have to have those values memorized. So you can see, for instance, they'll often tell you what the relevant heats of formation you need to calculate the answer to the question or often in passages there will be a table of heats of formation values. All right, so with this information, how can we calculate the heats of formation? Well, what we want to do is we want to add up all the heats of formation of the products. So our products is water, and we need to multiply it by the number of moles, right? This is referring to moles. And we have two moles of water, and we may need to multiply this by the heat of formation of water, which they tell us is negative 286 kilojoules per mole. And now we're going to subtract the heat of formation of the reactants times the number of moles. But conveniently here, hydrogen and oxygen are both diatomic elements in their standard state which means in their standard state, hydrogen and oxygen exist as these diatomic versions. And as we said, elements in their standard state have a heat formation of zero. So we're just subtracting zero, which tells us that the heat of formation of this reaction is simply going to be negative 572 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so this is how you calculate the heat of reaction using the heat of formation.